Uh, we're in uh, the book of Psalms. We're in chapter 14. Uh, we covered uh, verse 1 last week. We're going to cover verse 1 again this week. And then the rest of the psalm kind of fits together, as, as we'll see. Um, I want to say a couple of things before I, I dive into this. This is not a normal sermon uh, because I'm usually extremely uh, expositional, exegetical, following all the arguments, the, the verbs, the everything. This is a little different than that. When you're talking about the existence of God um, in our culture that rejects the scriptures, this is more of a philosophical approach, and there's a reason to that. There's four methodologies uh, in apologetics, uh, four different strategies if you're in the military for uh, addressing this, the question, is there a God or is there not a God? Classical apologetics deals with the question, is there even a God to talk about? That's, we're at point one today for a lot of our people who don't uh, have family members that don't believe in God, uh, or maybe you don't. Uh, so we start there. Is, is there even a God? Is there a logical reason to believe in God? Classical apologetics. That's what my doctorate is in, by the way. Two, evidential apologetics. Uh, what are the evidences in, in, that are built into the warp and woof of the cosmos that teach us there's a God? Um, Point three, presuppositionalism is, uh, presupposes the Bible is the word of God. It's the most powerful argument for God. And then fourth, fideism, faith. What God has done in my life, how God has transformed my life, what, what has happened in my life since I came to know Christ, you can't argue with the facts. And so your testimony of faith is a huge apologetic, uh, which is a whole other thing altogether. So which one are we talking about today? The first one. The first one. Uh, and so we'll get back into the verb analysis, past tense analysis, meanings of terms in a couple of weeks. I know you're just waiting to get back into grammar, are you not? Praise God. Thank you. Um, and it's good. How many are here for like the first time, like in months? Yes. Doesn't it feel good? Yes, it just feels good to be in God's house. So uh, with those things in mind, uh, let's pray. We're going to need it. Uh, God, thank you uh, just for what we're going to talk about today. We're talking about your existence and why that is the most logical conclusion a person can make in life. Uh, and it leads to wisdom, uh, and it leads, it leads to great living. Uh, ideally, uh, we're, we are just beggars looking for bread, uh, and uh, we who know you think we found the bread. And we're just lovingly pointing people to the bread of life, uh, which is you. And uh, we pray that what we say today might be clear and powerful and used by the Spirit uh, to uh, solidify the faith of your saints, to make them bold in sharing you, and it would uh, put a rock in the shoe of those who don't know you to cause them to wonder, is my position correct, or this, this looks awful good? Sh is there a God, and should I head in that direction? We pray that you would use this to your glory. Amen. Uh, last year, I took uh, my family uh, uh, and my grandkids and, and daughter to Disneyland, uh, Los Angeles, where we're from California. So we uh, went there and spent one day in uh, the old side of the park. The other day, this is the new side of the park. Um, had a lot of fun, rode a lot of fast rides, uh, and, uh, and it was just, it was totally enjoyable. Liz's uh, grandparents used to own a hotel basically across the street from Disneyland, so she basically grew up there because when she would uh, be dropped off there by her parents uh, with her brothers, uh, uh, they would just let them spend the day uh, at Disneyland. When they had the little e-ticket books, remember those? I still have one of those coveted items, but little e-ticket. I loved those things. And so they would just spend the day there. So she loved the place. My parents would uh, take us there. And back when I was a kid, where Liz is standing, used to be the parking lot where we parked our car. Uh, so things have changed over the years, but I love that place. So when I went to Azusa Pacific University, um, and you're probably thinking, what has this got to do with the existence of God? Everything. Plus, I knew children would be here. So instead of talking about ontology, metaphysics, and stuff, we've got to talk about Disneyland and the existence of God, okay? Uh, so let's think about it. What has this got to do with uh, the existence of God, everything? Uh, when I was at Azusa Pacific uh, going to school uh, in LA, I, I, had, I, I needed to work to help my parents pay for tuition and everything. Uh, and so I, I got a job as a, a janitor at a high school on, on uh, the hillside campus overlooking the uh, valley below. Uh, and I also was a janitor for the, the school, school's uh, art, art building and gym and football field and stuff up on the hillside as well. Every night I went up there and cleaned, every night. Uh, but I heard uh, through friends at the school that, that uh, Disneyland was offering jobs for uh, would-be gardeners. This is God's will for my life. I love gardening. Don't you know? Yeah, and so I'm thinking, this is, this is like the perfect job. Uh, back then, when I, I think I was making like four fifty an hour, really raking in the money. I think this job started at $10 an hour. I was like, I could retire. 
Uh, and so, you know, I, I, was, I, I was all over that. I could garden at Disneyland, mowing perfect turf, trimming perfect little bushes and topiary forms. I mean, what could be better? And so, so I did a whole, whole lot of checking to get this job. But I found out, um, because it, I started doing some logical reasoning, I had never seen a gardener. In, have you? I haven't. All the years I'd ever been at Disneyland, I'd never seen a gardener. But I thought, well, hey, you know, who knows when they garden? So I, I contacted uh, Disney and, and wor started working through, can I get a job here? And I found out that the job was from 11 at night to 7 in the morning. Huh? Uh, I'm a college student. I go to school all day. I'm taking 18 units. Uh, I get, well, well, hey, that's when it is. You know, I'm thinking, okay, I would love this job. But $10 an hour, I work all night, get up and go to school in the morning all day. I mean, like, when would I sleep, eat, etc. So what would, what would you have logically concluded that I did? Did I take the job? No. You know, sometimes you, call, you come so close to, like, nirvana, like, just the ultimate job. And so now I'm having to wait till heaven, because I'm sure everything in heaven is so much better. But what has this got to do with God? Well, it has everything to do with God. See, I, I'm the kind of guy, I can't go to Disneyland and relax. Because I'm always thinking. So I'm in the small world. Don't you love that ride? Dun, 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 dun. It's just like in your head. So, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's just in your head, you know. I thought I would, that was pretty good. Um, so you get in the little boat, and you know, you, my grandkids, they're all excited and everything. We're kind of floating in the blue water into this thing, hearing all the music and everything. And what do you see as you're going in? Beautiful topiaries, giraffes, elephants. There's a porpoise here and there. They're all over the place. Yeah. How'd they get like that? How'd they get like that? Well, you have two options, personal force or impersonal force. Impersonal force says, well, they just, uh, ontologically, they're just there. It's random chance. Those little plants must have been in the ground in L.A. for some reason when they built the park and just over, you know, years and years and years and years, they just kind of grew into those forms. Mm-hmm. Sure they did. Now, how did they become a topiary? Personal force. That somebody built a cage that represented something like a giraffe or an elephant or something, and, and from that extremely intricate structure was planted a bush that's, that's going to grow that something that you could trim that stays high and tight uh, and it's planted in there and then somebody comes at night and manicures it and makes it what it is because it's super complex to grow a topiary. Do you have any in your yard? Okay, <laughs> why don't you have them in your yard? <laughs> because they're hard to take care of. I know I have some in my yard. Some of them I've, I've been growing for a couple of years. You got to constantly trim, maintain, tie them up and it's a bunch of work. So I, I understand this. So even though I never saw a gardener at Disneyland, was there a gardener making these highly complex things? Answer is yes. So why then when I look at my cosmos, which is way more complex than a topiary, not conclude specified complexity must by definition point to a designer and gardener off the grid. Wouldn't that be the logical conclusion? See, David looks around at his world and he spent a lot of time doing it as a gardener. Or I mean as a, as a shepherd looking around at the stars and everything at night when he was taking care of the sheep. And he wrote things like Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth who has displayed thy splendor in the heavens. Who does not go on vacation away from D.C., somewhere in the mountains, somewhere where there's no light refraction, and look, who does not look up and just call your whole family outside to go, whoa, look, there are stars. And what do they teach you about? Well, the magnificence of God. Uh, David did that. Psalm 19, we'll eventually get there. He says, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. Indeed, they are, their brightness. They're just a reflection of how awesome his presence is. Their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours out forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. So if you want to know there's a God, he just said, just look up. You can just look up because the God who hung all that perfect perfection in space is, is the God who created you. He's the ultimate gardener. He's the ultimate designer. Psalm 14, David then says, he gives a word of warning in Psalm 14. What's his warning? Uh, verse one. He says, this is for the choir director. It's a Psalm of David. And what's the warning? The fool has said in his heart, what? Oh God, I don't have any proof. I got to see some proof. I mean, I need tangible proof. David says, uh, you got all the proof you need. 
I mean, just through, just through general revelation, as Paul argues in Romans 1. You have all the proof you need that there is a God. In fact, Paul's going to talk, talk about in Romans 1 that you can see the Trinity, the Godhead, through the complexity of the cosmos. It's a mind-boggling argument. So off-the-grid design uh, should, by definition, point to a designer. To say there's off-the-grid design and conclude there's no designer, Paul says, is or David says, is absolutely foolish. So if you would think it foolish for me to sit in the boat uh, with children and tell them, as we float by these highly complex topiaries, now, honey, you realize those just appeared there. They just kind of grew into that form, and there's no reason to rhyme it. It's just total luck and chance. You know, and given enough time, you get a topiary. No, given enough time, you get chaos, right? And so you would think I was crazy. So David says that you're foolish if you look at high complexity and conclude there's no God. So what are the evidence there, that there is a divine gardener? I know there's a gardener at Disneyland because they told me when they show up, even though I've never seen one. So even though I've never seen God, I will one day face to face, awesome day that will be, but I have evidences that he's here. So we want to review because brain cells die daily, okay? Did you hear me? You've already forgotten I even said that. So uh, brain cells die daily. So we want to talk about what we talked about last week. What are our evidences? There's a God. There's evidence from creation. Uh, uh, it's called the, co uh, the uh, cosmology argument from the cosmos. And so let's just review. There's two facets of it. And you probably have this memorized by now because we introduced it last week. Okay, so the cosmological argument. Does the cosmos teach me there's a God? Yes. Uh, there's the horizontal cosmological argument. It runs like this. It's a syllogism. Everything that begins has a cause, right? Chair, chair maker, shoes, shoe maker, etc. Uh, the universe had a beginning. We all know that from science. A big bang needs a big banger, or etc. Uh, number three, therefore, the conclusion is, since we know the universe had a, uh, had a, had a cause, there must be a cause to the cosmos. So you have two options when it comes to the cause of the cosmos. Impersonal, personal. I'll tell you which one I think is more logical. Personal. Personal is more logical than impersonal because how can impersonal create anything uh, of order and make things that are personal? But anyway, point two uh, is the uh, vertical aspect of the cosmological argument. So if there's a cause, what, do we, what should we think about the cause? Impersonal, personal. What's the argument? Something exists, because you do, because you're sitting in that chair right now, right? Correct? I mean, you're thinking about it. That's really scary. Uh, so you exist. Uh, nothing cannot produce something, correct? Right? Like a topiary can't produce itself. Uh, therefore, something exists each, uh, externally uh, and, or eternally and necessarily because I'm temporal. And then fourth, I am not a necessary and eternal being. Why? I change. A, a being that's, that's totally perfect like God never changes. To change is to be improved on. He needs no improvement. We do, don't we? Have you got your haircut during COVID? Wasn't that catastrophic when the, the haircuttery went away and then my haircutter retired on me? I was freaking out. I finally got a haircut this week. I was like, thank you, God. Uh, anyway, back to my sermon. Uh, uh, I am not necessary an eternal being since I can change. Thus, both God, who's a necessary being, uh, and I, a contingent being, exist. That's theism. We need him because we are temporal. He's eternal. He would be the first cause. Why? Because you cannot have imminent cause and effect backwards into infinity because you have to have something outside of causation who's not caused to start it. That's God. Our problem is we can't think outside cause and effect. I know how it works when you're, you know, you're a child. Okay, you know, okay, yeah, okay, okay. Let's see, the, my shoes came from a shoemaker. The shoemaker's parents made the shoemaker. The shoemaker's parents, parents made the shoemaker. So who made all of them? And then who, mommy, who made God? What do you tell your child? Listen to this sermon on July, whatever. Yeah, no, no. Who, ma who made God? No one. Why? Because he's uncaused. He's uncaused. So that's uh, evidence from causation. I would say it, it seems uh, from laws of causality, it's more logical to believe in God. It's not an airtight argument. But it seems more logical to head that way. Now, we want to talk this morning about evidence from design, design argument. Or, or it's called the teleological argument from the Greek word telos, which means the end of something, it's design. So you're wearing a mask right now. What's it for? Don't you think it's funny you can walk into a bank, everybody's got on a mask. It just cracks me up. I mean, so you have a mask on. What's it supposed to be doing? Protecting you, me, 
not you, me, we can argue, whatever. It's there for some form of protection. That's what it is designed for. That's its telos. It's teleology, all right? Uh, so design, uh, my headset is designed to project my voice into an auditorium. That is what it is designed for. That's its telos. It's, it's a design. So when you look at the cosmos, as complex as it is, this is the ultimate topiary uh, designed the way that it is. We can look at the cosmos after the fact and analyze the complexity and make deductions on well, what does that mean? What, what does that mean? Uh, Wayne House and uh, Joseph Holden, two Christian apologists, say, say this about this particular uh, proof of God. They say there is observable order uh, in, or design in the world that cannot be accounted for by the object itself. Like the chair, you, we couldn't even make that chair, anybody in this room, probably exactly like that. That takes somebody with intelligence to design it that way. Um, so they said, an inanimate thing can't pr- produce itself. This observable order argues for an intelligent being who established this order, that being is God. That's the argument. Dr. Geisler, uh, who's now with the Lord, um, uh, said this uh, one day in class. He said this, all complex design implies a designer. That's just logic. Two, the universe, especially life, has complex design by definition. Therefore, what's the conclusion of a thinking person? Well, the universe must have had a designer. It must have had a designer. Uh, and Geyser goes on to say, uh, he says, the greater the design, the greater the designer. See, it's one thing to, to, to make a topiary, like when I built them on my back porch for, for myself and for my wife, because I did them in California, so I started doing them here. They're a little harder here because of snow, frost, the whole shebang. I have to move them into covered parking during the winter. I mean, it's much more difficult than California. But um, it's one thing to make a topiary, it's a whole nother thing to make a person. Why? Think of all the systems that compose your body while you're sitting in your chair. It's test time. What are your systems? Digestive system, regulatory system. Aren't you in medicine? This is your time to wax eloquent. Respiratory, thank you. He pulls his mask down to tell me. <laughs> Cardiovascular, skeletal, renal, urinary. I mean, there's multiple systems, right? Right, you want them all functioning at the same time, do you not? This makes you, this, this makes you. This is highly complex. So could we say that you're, you sitting in your chair, one of the greatest arguments for the glory of God because of the complexity of the system in question. Is your body and its systems greater than the system of a topiary? <laughs> by default, by default. What did David say? A fool says in his heart, I don't see any evidence for God. You're not looking, is what David says. Uh, to me, one of the greatest uh, arguments for the, the existence of God is DNA code. I mean, for me personally, uh, when I read Francis Collins' uh, uh, book uh, uh, about the DNA, the language of God, uh, he who's head of the, uh, the you know, genome project, the whole DNA structure, a uh, great man, he's a, he's a believer. He's a Christian man. That, if you have never read that book, you should read that book. Um, now I'm gonna read you what he says about DNA code, because in my estimation, once they found DNA code, that should have been the end of the argument that there's a God, why? Because DNA code c- contains specified language. That which is impersonal doesn't create specified complex language. So, uh, SETI, you know SETI? You know, where they're looking in space for extraterrestrial, you know, and they got telescopes and radio, uh, uh, kinds of, Machines looking in space. What are they listening for? Commercials. Yeah, commercials. Thank you. No. They're listening for some intelligent kind of communication. You know, not just dot, 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 dit, dot, dot. They're looking for specified language that they can pick up to translate in that somebody is talking to us. And so when you look at DNA code, it's, it's specified language that could only come from a thinking mind. So this is a little bit long to explain DNA, and, and, but I need to explain it because it, it has to come from the scientist's mouth. Here's what he says, the head of that uh, DNA project. Here's what he says. He's a chemist. He says, as a chemist, knowing how extraordinary the qualities of DNA really are and how brilliant its solution is to the problem of coding life's design, he says, I am in awe of this molecule. The DNA molecule has a number of remarkable features by design. The outside backbone is made up of a monotonous ribbon of phosphates and sugars, but the interesting stuff lies on the inside. 
The rungs of the ladder are made up of combinations of four components called bases. He says, let's call them uh, from their actual names, uh, A, C, G, and T. This is the language. Each of these chemical bases has a particular shape. Now imagine that out of these four shapes, the A can fit a, neatly on a ladder rung next to T, a T shape. And the G shape can fit next to a C shape. These are base pairs. Then you can picture the DNA molecule as a twisting ladder with each rung made up of one base pair. He says there are four possible rungs, AT, TA, CG, and GC. He says if a single base is damaged of any one strand, it can be easily repaired by reference to another strand. The only possible replacement for a T is another T. That's interesting. He says, perhaps most elegantly, the double helix immediately suggests a means of its self-copying since it's, each strand can be used as a template for the re reproduction of a new one. If you split all the pairs in half, cutting your ladder down the middle of each rung, each la half ladder contains all the information needed to rebuild a complete copy of the original. Oh, by accident. He says, as a software program, which is what it is, sitting in the nucleus of the cell, its coding language has only four letters, or two bits in computer terms, in its alphabet. A particular instruction known as a gene is made up of hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of letters uh, of code. He says all of the elaborate functions of the cell, even the complex organism uh, as ourselves, have to be directed by the order of those letters in that chain. Translated, that DNA chain and how it functions as a computer program inside your body with the language of God who programmed it, couldn't just happen. It's what makes you you. The greatest argument that there's a God is your DNA structure. It's how you, how you operate. And I won't get into the uh, complexities of how it functions with RNA and all that stuff because it's too early in the morning. <laughs> Frank Turek, a great Christian apologist, says this about DNA code. Two things. Number one, he says, if we transcribed all of the books in all of the world's libraries into the language of DNA, their content would fit within a volume equivalent to 1% of the head of a pin. How could you take that much information and put it on such a small space, who would ever believe that happened and all of that complexity and all of that code that's been typed out as it were and fit it on such a small thing? That's the finger of God. It points to God. He goes on to say the 40 trillion cells uh, which house goal-directed DNA chains of your body, 40 trillion cells, uh, each contain a whopping and a jaw-dropping 3.5 billion letter program message which causes you to function as you. 3.5 billion dollars, uh, uh, should be dollars, uh, 3.5 billion letters in the code that makes you function. And what, is, what, did, what did David say? A fool has said what? Well, he said in his heart, there, there's no God. Are you kidding? Are, aren't you paying attention? See, the DNA code is elegant, and it's more elegant, it's more complex, it's beautiful, it's more beautiful than, than a topiary. And if the topiary points to a gardener uh, that's working there at night to make it beautiful, well then I would say the DNA structure is way beyond that beauty and complexity. And it needs a designer to design it. Uh, Anthony Flew, uh, an English philosopher, uh, who was uh, one of the signers of the Humanist, Humanist Manifesto the uh, Third, was a devout atheist. Uh, and in his late 80s, before he died, he eventually became what we would call a deist, a person who believes in God, but he created the cosmos and kind of is outside of the cosmos, but there is a divine being who made it all. Uh, he then didn't become a Christian, as it were, but he did head toward a belief in God based on the things that he saw. Here's, here's what he said later in his life. Quote, says, what I think that DNA material has done is that it has shown uh, by the almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life that intelligence must have been involved in getting these extraordinary device, diverse elements to work together. That, that would in his mind be God. And this was a leading atheist in his day and time. But toward the end of his life, he embraced the evidence. And I read more about him this morning when I got up early to look, work on my sermon. I read more about his life. Uh, and when he wrote his final book about his, his movement toward the divine concept, uh, when, they, when his peers responded to his letter, they just said that he was old and senile. I think not. 
He looked at the evidence. Francis Collins goes one step further. He says, for me as a believer, as a Christian, the uncovering of the human genome sequence held additional significance. He says, this book that I was reading, Language of God, was written in the DNA language by which God spoke life into being. He says, I felt an overwhelming sense of awe in surveying the most significant of all biological text. Yes, it is written in a language we understand very poorly, and it will take us decades, if not centuries, to understand its instructions, DNA, but we had crossed a one-way bridge into profoundly new territory. Indeed, they had. What had they seen? God's communication to us that, yes, I'm here. Look at the complexity of the language. See, crafting a topiary is one thing. It takes planned intelligence. Crafting a double helix of DNA, that's a whole other level altogether. I had a college student tell me one time. He said, hey, hey, hey Marty, you know, if, if God would just speak from heaven, Right now, while you are talking to me, I would believe in him. No problem. He has spoken to you. He has spoken to you. He speaks to you all the time. You're just not paying attention. And he is quite there. And, it, and Francis Schaeffer wrote a book a long time ago, uh, a little tiny book called He is There and He is Not Silent. I read it when I got out of college. And it is absolutely true. God is not silent. He's wooing you to himself. Are you paying attention to the information? Psalm 139, notice what David says. He says, I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He says, wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth in his mother's womb. God was weaving him together. This is why we are pro-life as a satellite. You're messing with what God's making. How dare you? He says, verse 16, thine eyes have seen mine unformed substance, and in thy book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. He said, when I was in my mother's womb, you were making me, all my DNA structure, to function, and you knew in my mother's womb my birthday, my death day, the number of steps I'd taken in life, how many hairs are on my head. That's how intimately you, the divine being, know me. Unbelievable. See, how foolish then to tell, tell your children, well, there's not really much proof that there's a God. It's, it's, just, it's just a blind faith that people have. No, no, there's plenty of proof. See, DNA code, in, in my estimation, is the nail in the coffin. It's the final intricate proof that there's a God who speaks most, most loudly. John Lennox, uh, master's uh, degree in, math, I think, mathematics, uh, philosophy doctorate. I mean, he's on and on go his credentials. Professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford. Uh, this is what he says about the finely tuned cosmos that DNA appeared in. He says this. He says, for the remarkable picture that is gradually emerging from modern physics and cosmology is one of a universe whose fundamental forces are amazingly, intricately, and delicately balanced um, of, or fine-tuned, he says, in order for the universe to be able to sustain life. Linux, profound mind. Uh, he says, if you look at the cosmos, it is so finely tuned, it's perfect for God to take a carbon-based person who's highly complex in their DNA structure, and he fine-tuned the cosmos to put them on one planet they can live on. Unbelievable. Uh, we call this, this is another argument for God, it's called the anthropic principle. And I won't give it all to you, I'll just summarize it for you. Anthropos is the Greek word uh, man. It's a principle for man. Translated that God so fine-tuned everything, it's not by accident on this razor edge of fine-tuning that we happen to live where we live. Uh, J. Warner Wallace used to be a um, uh, detective in the LA uh, PD force. Uh, he now writes as a detective about how to analyze proofs for God. Here's what he says about the anthropic principle. Three, uh, four things. One, he says, the physical constants and laws of the universe appear to be uniquely and specifically related to one another, fine-tuned, making life possible on earth. Two, the fine-tuned relationships of these laws and constants appear to be designed as their existence by natural, unguided means seems improbable or unlikely. Three, he says, a, re a design requires an intelligent designer, an incredibly, incredibly vast and complex design requires an incredibly intelligent and powerful designer to match the design. Four, God is the most reasonable explanation for such a vast universal designer. I agree. Uh, Dr. Hugh Ross, uh, when I taught at the National Apologetics Conference uh, a couple years ago with Ravi Zacharias and Chip Ingram and Josh McDowell, et cetera, when they flew me down there, uh, I went to a class with Dr. Hugh Ross. And in fact, he, they ran out of room. There was so many, there was hundreds of people and there, there wasn't enough seats. And so I, Liz and I ended up sitting on the floor off to the side. And then before he spoke, he came and he sat down on the floor next to me. 
this great astrophysicist, this great man of God, he's excellent on the anthropic principle, in case you're talking to friends like this, that it's no accident that things are finely tuned. In fact, he's written books on said subject. And I'll give you some, uh, just some of the many things that he said. Here's some things about fine tuning that this astrophysicist said. Fine tuning, the balance that we share. Uh, what's the first slide? I, the anthropic, uh, we need to go to that one, okay. Strong nuclear force. He says, think about the balance. If, if it's larger, well then there's no hydrogen, nuclei essential for life would be unstable. He says if the strong nu- nuclear force was smaller, no elements uh, other than uh, hydrogen would form. Could we live there? <laughs> no. Uh, weak nuclear force constants. Remember he's an astrophysicist. He says if larger, too much hydrogen converted to helium in the Big Bang, hence too much heavy element material made by star burning, no expulsion of heavy elements from the stars, we die. But, but if, it's, if it's smaller, then too little helium produced from the Big Bang, hence too little heavy element material made from star burning, no expulsion of heavy, heavy metal, metals from the stars, we die. On and on. I've, I've put probably 25 of these for the scientific thinking mind in my notes. You can read it tomorrow. One after the other, after the other, after the other. You get to the end of it and you're thinking, it is so finely tuned that there is no way that could have happened by chance that God made the cosmos just right to put us here. You believe in God? I do. Why do I believe in God? Because I think he's put the evidence all around the world that he is, that he exists. He finely tuned the world in which we live in. I see the fine tuning. I worship him who made it. I made it. Physicists, thinking people, uh, are those who believe in God. I'll give you a, a couple as a case in point. Uh, Vera Kistiakowski, MIT physicist, past president of the Association of Women in Science, said this, quote, the exquisite order displayed by our scientific understanding of the physical world calls for the divine. She's a physicist, MIT. Arno Penzias, uh, who shared the Nobel Prize in physics for the discovery of the cosmic background of radiation, said, quote, astronomy leads us to the unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with a very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. And he's a physicist, a thinking person who looks at the intricacy and says, a topiary calls for a designer, the intricate cosmos calls for a master designer, that must be God. What's that God like? I close with a couple of ideas what God is like of many things. Number one, in his person, he's transcendent, yet he's imminent. He's imminent. See, like when you're going through extreme difficulty and pain, he's with you. His eyes on you, too. In his person, he's highly complex, and he'd have to be by definition, because from complexity, uh, high complexity, comes one who's greater in complexity. That, that's who he was. That's why I believe in the Trinity. It's highly complex. Three, in his person, he's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He can hold all this together. And then he's, so dis- he's not so disclosed himself, he destroys my free will. He's not so pulled himself away from me, I can't find him. No, if you pursue him, you shall find him. First Chronicles 28 says this. As for you, my son Solomon, know the Lord your father and serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. That's a wise person. For God searches all hearts and he understands every intent of the thoughts. Notice the counsel from David to his son. Son, if you seek him, he will let you find him. That's awesome. If you're seeking him, you're gonna find him because he gave you enough evidence to see that he is. And if you are a Christian, you should be totally excited about your faith because it's grounded upon the evidences that point logically to the existence of God. So share our way that he is. Let's pray. God, thank you for betting into our world many evidences of your fingerprints all over everything Uh, Thank you for the surety of our faith, uh, and may we with great boldness and courage share uh, your reality to those uh, about us and point them to the great I am, the Christ, who holds it all together. We now give you our praise for those who've listened, and we pray those who struggle with faith and belief that you might allow them to find you as you draw them to yourself. Amen.